So I'm David Valley. Uh, I'm the, currently the director of uh, the Institute for Genetic Medicine at Johns Hopkins University, the McCusick Nathans Institute for Genetic Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I have been in that position since 2007. My background is as a pediatrician and then a, a geneticist uh, and uh, I guess also a genomicist. I'm one of these people who uh, was very early on captivated by something. And what I was captivated by was biology. So uh, my earliest memories of childhood were roaming, the f I lived in the country, roaming the fields and woods around my house and collecting anything that moved. And um, uh, when I got to grade school, I literally began to count off the years until I could take biology in seventh grade. And uh, so, and I had a very good seventh grade biology teacher who gave me special attention. And um, then it happened, my family moved to a big city, Kansas City, and I had an opportunity to take advanced biology, which I did. And, um, and then I went to Duke University where um, I advanced placed in zoology. And so I took in my first year comparative anatomy and genetics. Um, and the genetics teacher in the spring of my first year of college offered me a job and I took the job and for four years as an undergraduate at Duke I ran the uh, fruit fly lab and worked on uh, Drosophila experiments with Calvin Ward. And when I got, I, I went to medical school um, I got accepted into Duke. I, I did not, my undergraduate degree uh, uh, my undergraduate performance was, uh, you might even say binary. I did very well in sciences and not very well in the rest of the stuff. And um, so, um, but I was able to get into Duke, which is a far better medical school than I could have gotten into otherwise. And uh, once I got accepted at Duke, Calvin said, I'm gonna take you up and hand you off to the human geneticist. And he took me up the street to the medical school and introduced me to Jim Sidbury who was a um, pediatrician and trained at Hopkins and uh, uh, was interested in biochemical genetics. And I worked with Jim my whole four years of medical school. And um, so uh, I was basically hooked on genetics very early. And when I went, when I went to Hopkins to do a uh, residency, internship and residency, and I knew that I was gonna do genetics and um, uh, uh, had the great good fortune of a number of, there were a number of senior faculty colleagues who were very helpful during those years to me. Jim Sidbury, who was uh, irreverent and um, uh, informal and uh, funny, uh, uh, organized a weekly biochemical genetics rounds. And on those weekly rounds, the faculty included Jim Sidbury uh, Bill Kelly, who went on to be uh, to Michigan and then to Penn. Uh, Jim Weingarten, uh, who went on to be the director of uh, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, Stan Appel, who went on to be chairman of neurology at some place in Texas, I forget whom, where. And um, another medical student, Harvey Cohen, who went on to be chairman of pediatrics at uh, Stanford and is still at Stanford, I think. Harvey and I were the only two medical students that went on these rounds, but we religiously went on these rounds with these guys who really were, you know, um, very, very prominent in their field. It was intellectually stimulating to see how the patients were um, approached, what, what sorts of, uh, what was the thinking behind whatever the symptoms were and uh, what sort of uh, diagnostic workup was uh, envisioned and we saw lots of patients with uh, you know rare and um, to me uh, quite fascinating uh, disorders. I always say that uh, medicine is made up of two kinds of people those that are interested in things that are very rare and those that by contrast say oh that's so rare I'll never see it again I don't I don't care to even learn about it and so uh, in those days, the people that went into genetics were by and large interested in rare disorders, which could be recognized, rare Mendelian disorders, because they could be recognized by virtue of their pedigree. That was a key sort of diagnostic tool we had in those days. And um, 
Harvey and I, Harvey Cohen and I would, you know, walk all around the school just to see one case of whatever, something that would be, um, we would be unlikely to see again. But during my freshman year at Duke, I was still considering uh, as an alternative to medicine, uh, a career as a field biologist, basically, because I love biology. And, um, but I can remember walking home one night from the zoology building where the fruit fly lab was <laughs> and saying uh, to myself, um, you know, I really would like to have a direct sort of humanistic reward, uh, and so I'll choose medicine. And um, I also knew for some reason uh, not only would I do genetics, but I would um, do it in the context of pediatrics. Um, I liked kids. Um, I think pediatricians uh, are like the idea that if you, you have a child who has a problem, if you fix that problem, then they have their whole life ahead of them. While if you're an internist, it's like uh, patching up a car. You know, just patch this, patch that. And so uh, in the one case, the patients are on the ascendancy of their life, and on the other case, the patients are increasingly on the descendancy of their life. So I, I actually much preferred pediatrics to um, um, internal medicine or other such things. So uh, I loved medical school um, at Duke. It was fantastic. Um, but I knew right from the beginning I would do pediatrics. One person who really played a role in helping to make Hopkins interesting, as an interesting place for me to go, um, was Mike Kaback. Mike Kaback was a biochemical geneticist. He's responsible for developing the tay uh screening test. Uh, and um, very energetic, very interested in biochemical genetics. And when I interviewed, he took me all around. I remember he drove me to the airport uh, when I was going home and, um, you know, sort of gave me the sales pitch on the way to the airport. Um, and then um, <clears throat> uh, Rod Howell, who was another um, biochemical geneticist there, was a very good colleague or very good person to talk to. I was especially close to the hematologist, Bill Zinkum, uh, who was a good friend so with Jim Sidbury, my me Duke mentor. And, um, and I was very close, particularly um, after I finished my house staff training, to Saul Brusolo, who I think was, um, who developed all the ways we currently treat urea cycle disorders. And uh, in my mind, is one of the greatest uh, clinical investigators I've ever seen. And, um, uh, and then, of course, Barton Childs. And I will just say that my interactions with Barton really began a little bit while I was a house officer, but then I, when I joined the faculty, um, uh, I can actually remember I was writing um, a paper not too long after joining the faculty and um, uh, for the Johns Hopkins um, Hospital Bulletin or something, it was a, sort of a local journal, and it was on a, some a couple of patients I had with uh, homocystinuria, an inborn error of uh, cysteine met methionine metabolism, and um, I was trying. I was writing a sentence, and I was trying. I was dealing with uh, what a fly geneticists would refer to as the wild type. That is the sort of normal. And at that point, we knew a little bit more about genetic variation, and I realized uh, the thought occurred to me that uh, the wild type is not some sort of um, unitary um, thing, but actually if you could really know everybody who was currently wild type would have all kinds of variation in it. And I was struggling with how to say that in a sentence, and I walked out of my tiny little office into the hallway and bumped into Barton Childs. So I asked him, I said, I mean, I'm trying to write, I'm trying to indicate sort of normal um, I want to say wild type, but I know that is really not, that's a, a gross simplification of what's really going on. And uh, can you help me? And he looked at me and he said, you're learning. <laughs> that's all he said. <laughs> he left me to struggle. Uh, I do know when I met Victor, precisely. So 
I, like all interns, I start on July 1st. I started July 1st, 1969. And um, I think most, most physicians, I'm not sure, um, sort of organize their life around their internship year. There's sort of pre-internship and post-internship. Uh, and I love that internship year, so I have strong and positive memories of it. I took over the, I inherited a set of patients on the infant floor on my first day. Um, many of them actually were taken care of by Art Baudet, who preceded me and left on June 30. And so I picked up Baudet's patients, and he went on to be director of genetics at uh, Baylor for so many years. Um, but my senior resident, Dick Kessler, said to me, this child is um, a dysmorphic child. In those days, a funny looking kid was the term that was unfortunately used. And um, you need to put in a consult to Victor McCusick. So on the second day of July, I think it might have been July 3rd, not July 2, um, I called up McCusick's office. And he answered the telephone. And uh, I said, this is David Valley. I'm a new intern in pediatrics, and I have a child who's uh, dysmorphic, and I wonder if you would be able to come by and take a look and tell us what you think. And he said, okay, I'll be there in five minutes. And five minutes later, it just happened I called him when he was taking his entourage on their weekly rounds. And five minutes later, this group of about 20 people comes walking down the hall, and I'm running around like mad trying to organize my thoughts of how to present this uh, patient to Victor, introduced myself. We went in, um, and Victor in his starch, uh, you know, clean starched white coat, looked over the edge of the high climber, or crib with, you know, with high things on it, and um, looked for about, I don't know, maybe 60 seconds at the most, and looked up and said to me, I don't know. And um, I was disappointed because I was, of course, looking for a diagnosis. Later on, I realized that was a very important thing for him to say because if he had said, I don't know, but I think it might be this, then I would have immediately stopped thinking about the patient and just said, okay, this, this patient is an example of this disease. And that's in the olden days, that's the way it was done. The most senior clinician would say, I think, you know, it's this, and then we would all yeah. deal with that one entity rather than um, keeping our thinking caps on and saying, you know, trying to put it into context. You know, maybe some people think it's this, some people think it's that, but it was very, um, <clears throat> again, it's, I think, human nature to try to organize and, and um, simplify biology, which is much more complex than our ability to simplify. So, um, in retrospect, I appreciated very much that Victor did that. I was away for two, uh, three years at NIH in the middle of my residency when I came back. Then John Littlefield, who was the chairman of pediatrics, offered me a job. I didn't do any fellowship or anything. I just was a senior resident one day and assistant professor the next day. And I was to learn clinical genetics that I, in addition to whatever I'd picked up during my residency, uh, from a man named Thad Kelly. But Thad took a job. Um, and went to the University of Virginia a couple of months before I started. So I was a senior resident one day, and then I was the director of the pediatric genetics clinic the next day. And um, then I saw a lot more of Victor. And uh, about two weeks after joining the faculty, John Littlefield called me to his office and said, do you know anything about the Bar Harbor course? And I said, I don't know anything about the Bar Harbor course. And he said, well, it's a course that Victor runs. You should go. Uh, and he said, I'm going to call up Victor and see if there's still a chance for you to go this year. <clears throat> so he, he called me back the next day and he said, I talked to Victor and uh, there is an opportunity for you to go this year, which was like a week later. And uh, he said, um, the only um, issue is that he needs someone to talk about lysosomal storage diseases. So you'll have to give a one hour lecture on lysosomal storage diseases about which I knew I was not any special expert on lysosomal storage disease. So then I frantically uh, prepared a lecture on lysosomal storage diseases. And those pre-PowerPoint days, preparing a lecture from scratch was not easy. <laughs> and um, so I was up night and day getting that lecture ready. And um, 
which in those days was all about just the clinical differences of the various kinds of uh, lysosomal storage diseases. And so I gave my lecture at the short course um, and uh, in the first week of the short course. And um, Kurt Hirschhorn, a very famous human geneticist, terrific guy, was in the audience. So when I finished my lecture, Kurt asked me a question. And uh, I tried to answer it. And then Victor asked me a question, and I tried to answer that. And then I realized that Victor and Kurt had some disagreement about some idea about lysosomal storage diseases. And they were using me as a tennis ball to go, <laughs> go back and forth, um, which you know, was, was fine, it was fun. And um, the other thing about that first short course was that, uh, which is I think 43 or 44 years ago, um, was that <clears throat> at some point in the first week, Victor had a faculty meeting and he said, you know, we still have some holes in the second week and we need someone to, treat, to talk about the treatment of genetic disease. And the various faculty were, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be gone by then. And so, so I ended up giving two lectures the first time I went. One was on lysosomal storage diseases and the second lecture prepared on the fly was on the treatment of genetic disease. I continue to give that lecture to currently. Um, so from that point forward, I went to every short course. And in 1990 or 91, I became a co-organizer with Victor. And <clears throat> while our initial interactions were pretty junior, senior, once I became the co-organizer of the short course, we really worked together a lot. And he became much more uh, informal. Victor was very much more informal in Maine and at the short course than he was at Johns Hopkins, where he was very formal, by and large. I have the greatest uh, admiration for Victor um, and what he accomplished, but he, he was a man of few words around Johns Hopkins. I mean, I, I had an experience where I got summoned to his office and I walked into the office and he was working at his desk and he, I sat down and he said, I wanted to ask you something. I don't, I don't know what the question was. He asked me the question. The answer took maybe 10 seconds or 15 seconds. And then he returned to whatever it was he was doing. And I sat there and after about 30 seconds, I figured, well, I guess, guess it's over, you know. And I got up and left. So we, we, um, we had, uh, you know, several interactions of that type. A, a very important part of my career, uh, again, just happened by accident, was that uh, you may know that Hopkins has close ties to the Peking Union Medical S School, PUMC it's called, and uh, that, those ties were established by William Welch in 1912 or 13. And uh, there's pictures of Welch sitting on a donkey in the Great Wall of China back then and stuff. And after the Cultural Revolution, uh, there was a very a wonderful man by the name of uh, Wilson Lowe, who had trained with Victor at Hopkins and then went back to China and was trying to develop genetics in China. But when the Cultural Revolution came, of course, he had to go to the countryside. And so as soon as the Cultural Revolution was over, Wilson got in touch with the people at PUMC and also with the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences and came over and spent two weeks at Hopkins reacquainting himself with all of his former colleagues. And he organized this trip uh, for several leaders of Hopkins to go visit PM PUMC in China um, for two weeks. And um, so, he asked six prominent faculty members, the dean, Dan Nathans, Ham Smith, John Littlefield, um, uh, um, and some others, Dick Johns and um, Tom August. Uh, and uh, at the last minute, uh, and their spouses, at the last minute, Joanne Nathans could not go. So a slot opened up. And so they called, or they, I don't know what they did, they contacted Wilson. And he said, well, send Valley and Joanne Nathan's place because Wilson was trying to start a pediatric genetics clinic and he knew that I was running the pediatric genetics clinic at that time. So I went 
and um, with all these people who are very, very much more my senior. Um, and, uh, but we had a really fantastic uh, time in uh, China, traveling around, meeting Chinese physicians, seeing them rebuild their uh, medical system and so forth and so on. Um, but that was a chance for me to really become uh, sort of on a first name basis with all of these leaders of Hopkins who are all much, much my senior at that time. Uh, and, uh, and we had a lot of, a lot of great experiences. Uh, the only thing I can remember is that my uh, interactions with NIH, I think, aside from submitting grants, uh, came when I was asked to ad hoc on the mammalian genetics study section. The mammalian genetics study section was a, quite a well-known study section. It was sort of like a club. And um, uh, I ad hoced. I remember I sat next to Carlo, uh, what is Carlo's last name? Carlo Croce. I don't know if you ever, he has this big, like, like an opera singer's voice. He was, you know, he was could, you know, very voluble and, and everything. And, um, and so I ad hoc and then later I was asked, I guess I did okay on my ad hoc, uh, to become a permanent member of that study section, which I did. And uh, at, when I became a permanent member of the mammalian genetic study section, uh, Tom Kasky was the chair. And when Tom rotated off, I think he said to the um, SRA for the study section, uh, I think he recommended me to, be, to replace him. So I, I went from being a member of the uh, mammalian genetic study section to uh, the chair of the mammalian genetic study section. I think I actually did that for a couple of years. So I was sort of, that got me tied into genetics at NIH and so forth. And, um, sort of to know people, and um, um, I think probably that connection led to me being asked to um, become a, an advisor for the Genome Project. So I'm very interested in the Genome Project, but Hopkins passed on it, didn't, didn't have a program there that was part of the Genome Project. Uh, so this was fantastic for me because it was a way for me to be sort of involved in the Genome Project but not, you know, churning out the sequence or anything like that. One of the earliest things I remember was that Craig Venter, at that time uh, Ham Smith had just left um, Hopkins and taken a position with Craig Venter at, at the Venter Institute or Tiger, it was called Tiger then. and. Um, they came to visit Hopkins, and I had lunch with them, a small group of people, including myself, had lunch with Ham and uh, Craig. And um, Craig, during the discussion at lunch, Craig was talking about the sequencing of the human genome. And at that point, he was a grantee of NHGRI. And um, uh, so I could see from his conversation that he was very committed to um, sequencing the Human Genome Project. And I also noticed that, uh, that he was like looking at Ham and winking and uh, it, uh, Craig is not particularly subtle. And uh, so I thought, well, this is weird. What is, what is, he? they're like, you know, got some secret or something like that. And um, the next week as it would happen, uh, we, um, the advisors met. I, I can't quite remember how far I, long I was or anything, but um, the, well, I can remember because the, this must have been towards the end of the first round of funding, maybe the first three years of funding or something like that. Because I can remember Jane Peterson, who was terrific. And, you know, Mark Geyer and Jane Peterson are there, and, um, and Francis. And so Jane was standing up and she was going over the, the various um, sequencing centers had been reviewed and she was going over their responses to their reviews. The NHGRI had asked them to, um, you know, uh, respond to their reviews about what they were going to fix about this, that, or the other. And uh, she came to Tiger, which, as I say, was a member of the, the thing. And <clears throat> she said, it's very bizarre. She said, uh, we really haven't gotten a response from Tiger. They had a, there were a number of criticisms. Uh, and they haven't responded. 
and it's almost like they're, not, they're no longer interested. And I thought, well, that's weird because it was less than a week that I had had lunch with them and I could tell that Craig was really hot on the sequencing of the human genome. I actually didn't put two and two together, but about three days later then, Tiger sent back their grant and said they were going to go their own way and use a different strategy to sequence the genome project. And then, so then the race was on, basically. In those first few years, um, there was all this, uh, you know, that was a sort of lurking over everyone's shoulder was Tiger and Craig Venter and whether their method was going to, um, um, you know, were they going to do it faster or better than the, the sort of uh, publicly funded genome project headed up by Francis. And so that was sort of the, um, in, in everyone's mind and everyone's discussions during that time. Uh, and um, I can remember, I, I think you probably know that when Craig made that announcement, he said he was going to try out his strategy on Drosophila to see if he could see, do a whole genome sequence of Drosophila. And if he was able to, using this sort of shotgun sequencing and then reassembly at the end, um, then he believed that would be proof of principle that he could do the human. And he made a, quite a bold uh, promise of when they would finish the Drosophila genome. And um, I think we had conversations saying, well, I don't know if that's, we thought, well, I don't know if that's going to work. It seems a little difficult to imagine how it would work. I mean, in retrospect, now dealing with computers and everything, it was, was easy, you know, you could see it would work. But anyways, and so I think we, for a while, we were sort of thinking, well, that's probably not going to work. We'll beat them. It's not, not that big of a deal. Um, but then, uh, you know, uh, I don't know when, uh, how, many, how much longer it was, six months later, or eight months later, or nine months later, you know, he announced they had to sequence the Drosophila genome. And so that was proof of principle that his strategy would work, and now he was turning to the human genome. And um, so I can, re I can remember this meeting at uh, Arley House, Early House, and I don't remember the date, you probably can figure it out. I know Francis remembers the meeting. Um, and um, everyone is sitting around the room. And I, I sort of felt like I was part of the Genome Project, even though I was simply a, an advisor. I was, wasn't doing the work. I was just showing up periodically to give my two cents worth. And, um, uh, but as I looked around the room, uh, you know, there's Bob Waterston, Eric, um, uh, um, I guess Richard was there from Baylor, um, and everybody looked to me like they were exhausted. They looked, uh, their spirits were down, um, they looked whipped in a way. And um, it reminded me, in part I guess because we were at Airly House, it reminded me of what it must have been like during the Civil War where the generals would come in in the evening and they'd had a hard day or they're, maybe they'd w lost a battle and they were, you know, hanging on by their fingernails, basically. And um, so Francis presented a sort of a talk about how we're going to deal with this and blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and for some reason um, I said, I'm always an optimist, and I don't really shy away from a challenge. So I said, well, I, I can't even remember what I said, but I said something positive that sort of reinforced a little bit what Francis had said. And then Bob Waterston said, well, you know, I think we can do this. It was like everybody got up and went back to their labs and, you know, went at it, basically. As, as I say, it, it certainly caused a lot of anxiety and a lot of increased pressure and so forth. But in retrospect, obviously, it was great to have a competitor. Uh, I mean, that really drove things fa much faster. And, um, and, and then, of course, you know, uh, miraculously, both groups ended up on the same day declaring uh, that they had <laughs> achieved a draft sequence of the uh, human genome. I made a slide of the New York Times headline, which is across the, the headlines on the front page, a draft sequence of the human genome. And um, 
And then shortly thereafter, uh, you know, that was right uh, around uh, 2000, and the Clintons were having their um, these millennial uh, evenings, evening uh, celebrations at the wet in the White House, and um, so uh, I was I got an invitation to go to that, and that's where. Uh, Francis and Craig were there, and, and Bill Clinton got up, and um, oh, actually, we were all sitting, standing around there, and there was, you know, nobody there. And then the band starts up playing "Hail to the Chief," and down the center aisle comes Bill Clinton, and um, and you know, with Francis and uh, Craig behind. Now it is said, I didn't actually see this with my own eyes, but others who were in the room said. There was a lot of anxiety because it was so exciting to be, you know, here at the White House and so forth and so on. And that when the, um, and, and Bill Clinton was standing in the wings with Francis and Craig, and when the band played Hail to the Chief, Francis turned and started to walk down the, um, the aisle, and Bill Clinton reached out and grabbed his shoulder and said, when they play this song, I go first. <laughs> and so down they went, and uh, then, Clinton introduced them, and they were sitting on either side of them. There are lots of you know, famous pictures of them sitting there. And the McCusicks were sitting just to my left front, and uh, Francis was pointing out Victor to uh, Bill Clinton. And um, the amazing thing to me on that night was that um, uh, uh, the um, how quickly Bill Clinton seemed to catch on to what the Genome Project meant, and this business about, you know, we're all 99% uh, identical and all this kind of stuff. But I, I thought, wow, that guy is quick, because he, he may have been doing homework, but he seemed to catch it that night about what kinds of opportunities this afforded and what a real watershed moment it was. So he, it was very impressive to me to see him figure that out on, on, on the fly, as it were. Um, the other funny thing on that night was, there were many funny things about that night, but one was I was standing in line to go in, and I think uh, this was like two weeks or so after Harold Varmus uh, stepped down from being the director of NIH. And uh, when you, each of us would walk up to the guards and they would say what your name is, and they'd look and see, oh, you're on the list and everything. And so they, Harold was like about 10 people ahead of me. And when Harold got up there, the guard said, you're not on this list. <laughs> and so he was saying how quickly they forget because you know two weeks earlier he'd been the director of NIH, but he, they did let him in. It took a little um, uh, you know, screwing around to make sure that he, he got in. But um, that, that was a wonderful uh, event, basically. That, well, I think that, that day at the okay. Early House was really one for me. And, um, the other one was, I just couldn't believe, I mean, I have great admiration for all of the people that were leading those labs and doing that work. Um, but each one was quite different from the other. They had very different personalities, and their laboratories had very different personalities. Lee Hood was a major player at that time, and um, others, and, and well, um, Maynard Olson was yeah, right. there, and. Uh, um, I just, and Francis had a weekly call with that people, those folks, and talk about herding cats. I mean, um, just gearing up for and managing those weekly conference calls must have been an enormous strain. I don't, I don't know how he did it, frankly. And, um, and he was, you know, he was trying to keep or uh, many, many things in the air. First of all, he's a, a, a a very accomplished uh, scientist. So he could command the respect of these people because he understood the science. And they viewed him as a, an intellectual and scientific equal. But in addition, he had this um, poise that enabled him to um, you know, think ahead, where possible, avoid potholes, uh, you know, make sure we didn't insult this person or we didn't do this or that. Uh, and of course, that was a skill that James Watson did not have and would, and would have 
you know, he couldn't have done that. Uh, and I have, you know, scientific admiration for Watson, but uh, he couldn't have done that part of it at all. And, um, uh, but Francis did it, and he did it for a long time. And uh, uh, so it's a remarkable achievement on his part. I also remember the Early House, a, a subsequent Early House meeting where Francis stood up and said, you know, I think we should declare victory. I think we're done. And that was in 2003, right, where he's, he, I think it was 2003, where he said, you know, we're, we all know that we haven't sequenced every last base and we haven't plugged every little hole, but uh, we've, um, uh, um, you know, we're, you know, we're approaching an asymptote, and I think we should say we've we've got it. And then people said, "Well, we want to, we all want to make an agreement that we're going to finish every chromosome." And so then they came out one at a time thereafter. Another key time, and I'm sure you've heard about this as well, but um, this was very early, and uh, we were at a meeting, and Francis said, um, uh, "You know." we become aware of a um, problem. It was very early. Um, and the problem was that um, um, the guy who was making the yak libraries, uh, Peter Dijon, um had, in retrospect, uh, I mean, these yak libraries were this sequencing substrate for the genome project. and what set our approach apart from the tiger approach. And he um, said when, you know, Peter de Jong made these libraries, he did start with samples from a s relatively small number of people, maybe uh, 10 or 12 or something like that. And not all of them yielded very good back libraries, and so the number of successful back libraries is actually quite small. And we've become aware of the fact that um, at this point, I think we were 12 percent there or something like that, that the bulk of the sequence so far is from one person. And uh, this raises LC issues because, you know, we're essentially undressing this person to the world and uh, without him, him or her, it was him, uh, signing, you know, signing consent for that kind of scrutiny. And um, so here are our options, we think. One is we can discard all the sequence we have so far and start afresh and do it in a way that we have learned would be a better way to do it. Um, or we could, um, I only remember two options, or we could um, uh, rapidly ask Peter Dijon to make a bunch of new libraries and mix those in with the existing libraries and dilute out this individual uh, back clones uh, by these new libraries, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, uh, it wouldn't erase the sequence that we've already gotten, but that would only be, you know, let's say 10% of the total or something like that. And he, I think we voted on it, and of course we all voted to the latter because we didn't want to, we were in a race and we didn't want to, um, we didn't want to um, take that progress and put it in the trash. We have learned that genetic information is very powerful uh, for lots of different reasons. And uh, we all of us want to make sure that um, we reap the benefits of this powerful information. And we all have learned that uh, there, there are also many problems that one could get into with this information. And that would only take one really bad problem to derail the whole effort or give us the whole effort of black eye. And uh, so I think that's p also part of Francis's genius that he, uh, I'm thinking he spent a lot of time sleeping at night or laying in his bed at night trying to think of every possible um, problem we could get into and uh, avoid it. And I think that was a good example of um, where we, you know, close to really, you know, opening a, uh, getting into something that was a bad situation and, uh, and it was avoided. Ah, yes. <laughs> so I was on the, uh, uh, so I, I did the Genome Project Advisory Committee. 
And then uh, that committee sort of morphed into something called the Sequencing Advisory Panel. Right. And Rick Lifton was the chair, and I was on that committee. I think we were on it for maybe 10 years or something like that, quite a long time. And that uh, was interesting because basically what we would do is we would go around from sequencing center to sequencing center and sort of do a, a site visit. And so that was interesting because I, as much as I had been adv involved in the advising, um, I had not actually seen much of the actual, um, you know, place where the work was done. And so in the course of those site visits, uh, which also included the, the uh, intramural staff, Jane and Mark and, and um, uh, Rudy Pizzotti and, and, and uh, you know, it, the intramural staff was really a terrific team. And um, so that was quite interesting to go to the Broad and to Wash U and, and other places to see that Tiger. We went to Tiger. Uh, but that was fun. And then we, we did the sequencing advisory panel. And then at some point, I can't remember for sure, but now I know almost about 22 years ago, 22, I think is when CIDR came along. I was actually the acting director of the Center for Medical Genetics at Hopkins. I couldn't be the director because I was a Hughes investigator and Hughes wouldn't allow a, one to take a large administrative position. And uh, we got, somehow we got wind of the fact that uh, uh, the idea had been hatched at, um, at NIH that it would be good to have a, uh, a center that would provide high throughput genotyping for uh, uh, investigators in a bunch of uh, NIH institutes and that uh, NHGRI was going to take the lead on that. And so they were, and they didn't have enough space, they thought, to do it on the Bethesda campus. So they were looking, and they thought it would be best served to be on an academic campus. And they, um, uh, so they were looking at Maryland, University of Maryland campus, uh, College Park. And we got wind of it and we quickly fired down, hey, don't forget about it. Because it turns out, of course, you take the tunnel under Baltimore, the, the Bayview campus is really pretty easy get from uh, Bethesda. And um, so uh, that moved very quickly and we were able to convince uh, Francis and the others that um, uh, this would be a good opportunity. So, and I was very excited because frankly, because I saw this as a chance for us to get as in as a participant in genomics and that this would build genomics at Johns Hopkins, um, which we had passed on, not me, but others before me had passed on at the start of the Genome Project. So uh, we were thrilled to get that uh, contract and it continues to be very successful. It's, I think we're now in our 22nd year. And the, but the first person I hired was Kim Doheny, who uh, is the current director, who's terrific. I couldn't have, couldn't have found anywhere in the world uh, a better person to do that job. And she's a graduate of the graduate program I run at Johns Hopkins. Uh, so I knew her well because she had done her, her PhD actually with Phil Heater, East Genesis. And um, uh, she was interested in coming back to Baltimore. So she was a perfect um, candidate to start this new venture. And she came in and, and uh, for a while, Alan and I uh, sort of ran things. We, we tried to hire, we tried to recruit a senior person, but, and we had several people close to signing, but in the end they didn't sign. And I finally went to Bob Nussbaum, who at that time was a contract officer, and I said, who well, I knew very well. And I said, Bob, um, you know, we're now 18 months or two years in, and um, we're both sort of learning on the fly here, but if you're comfortable with me taking the directorship, we'll quit spending our effort trying to recruit someone, and we'll just do it, and that's what we did. That's been very, very good for Johns Hopkins. I think CIDR has done a terrific service for the community uh, and uh, continues to provide fantastic service to the community. I would argue that we are the best uh, high throughput genotyping lab in the world. So um, uh, we, didn't, we didn't develop our sequencing as much as that, but we certainly provided great genotyping. Remember, at the, I think in the first five years, the uh, uh, goal was to be at the end of five years to be able to do one million genotypes a year. A year. Now we do billions in a week. <laughs> Not a, we don't do billions in a week, but we 
we, I mean, when they're cranking, it's amazing what they can do. One other thing that you, you should, that I'm very, I, in retrospect, is, I can't take complete credit for, but I certainly helped, was I came on and was president of the American Society of Human Genetics. And um, I don't remember what year that was, but it was around the early 2000s, maybe. And um, at that time, there was almost no genomics in the sort of scientific platform of the American Society of Human Genetics. Um, and I felt, I thought, well, come on guys, uh, genomics is booming here. We gotta, it's gotta be incorporated in ASHG. And, um, and so one of the, I guess I would say the major goal of my presidency and the president serves on the board before and after, so I sort of able to influence things for a while, um, was to bring as much genomics into the ASHG as possible. Now, of course, the whole meeting is filled with genomics. Uh, and the, the sort of interaction between genetics and genomics is very synergistic as it should be. And, um, but one of the things we did is, I remember I asked Francis to come and give a talk there, uh, which was sort of like the first talk about, um, at our annual meeting, which is sort of like the first talk about the Genome Project and what, what would be expected, what would be the benefits and so forth of all this new information. For me, the person that really mattered in that was Barton Childs again. Because Barton said, uh, look, this is great that the specialty of medical genetics has grown up and the boards and exams and journals and all of the accoutrements that a specialty in medicine should have. Um, and that's a great achievement to have a medical genetics be a recognized uh, specialty. Um, but, Barton said, uh, just stand back and look at the biology. Uh, genetics is important for all of medicine. And uh, victory, you, you can't declare victory until we've integrated genetics and now genomics into all of medicine. So I, I have this two slide thing where I show what I call the medical pie and medical genetics is a tiny slice of the medical pie. Again, people who like, who are turned on by finding rare things. And, um, and, but then what the future is, and which is that medical geneticists should be the leaders to integrate genetics into all of medicine. Some medical geneticists felt threatened by that and didn't, didn't, didn't want to do that. They didn't they want to keep, you know, keep that area to themselves, but it's, it's too big to keep to yourself. It, and it's, it's too small-minded to keep to yourself. And, um, and uh, we should spread the wealth, and we're the ones that should be able to lead that spreading because we know lots of examples of how genetics affects health and disease. And um, so we should be the, the, the people that lead the integration of genetics and genomics into medicine. And I think now we are. Um, uh, and it hasn't hurt the specialty of medical genetics um, doing just fine. Um, so we shouldn't have been threatened by it. Well, so human genetics really was almost uh, equated to Mendelian genetics for a long time, right? So Mendel was rediscovered in 1900, and then progress was slow. Uh, there was this sort of uh, the Mendelian ancestrian debate up until Fisher in 1918. And, um, uh, and then it sort of became a plotting, uh, recognizing Mendelian phenotypes, and the actual, the the inheritance pattern was a key part in recognizing the Mendelian nature of the disorder. Um, and people who liked rare things would, you know, be just thrilled that we had figured something out. And um, uh, what happened was then the Genome Project came along, and, and then uh, GWAS was developed, and attention moved way away from Mendelian genetics Mendelian genetics was pretty much situated in the American Society of Human Genetics, and the Genome Project came in and just sort of, you know, overran everything. And then all the young people were going into genome-wide association studies, and that was all the rage for about 10 years, or 12 years. And uh, someone who's doing Mendelian disease couldn't barely, you know, get above the water line. And, um, 
There were a couple of papers. There's an important paper written by Stelios Antonarakis and Jackie Beekman uh, on something to the effect of don't forget Mendelian genetics. And um, I don't, I'm not sure of this, but I know that I was at a meeting at Cold Spring Harbor, something to do with the genome project. And uh, there was a breakout group. There were these typical breakout groups. And Jane, P I was the chair of the breakout group, and Jane Peterson was my sort of um, intramural uh, partner. And Bob Waterston was in the audience of the, our breakout group as a participant. And the idea was hatched that uh, in addition to the large scale centers, perhaps there should be some sort of intermediate level centers that were good at sequencing, but they also brought in people who are good at phenotyping and who were nimble enough to do small jobs, whereas the large scale centers are really all geared to do massive jobs. And small jobs that required a lot of back and forth with the submitter and everything were not really, uh, was not really um, very efficient use of the large scale centers. And I don't remember who suggested that idea, but I do remember, and it might have been Bob, uh, I do remember uh, thinking, this sounds like a great idea to me. And it's, I did think, I'm mean, not supposed to think of these things, but I did think this could be a real opportunity for us. So I was really hot on the idea as well. And then, uh, you know, maybe 18 months or two years later, out came the RFA for the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. And, um, and I said to my colleagues at Hopkins, look, if we're going to go in on something, we, can't, we cannot say no on this. And um, uh, because, you know, we have 50 years of Mendelian genomics sitting here. So um, that's how that came, I think, in part, how that came about. And um, uh, it's been terrific for us. Um, we, I mentioned Art Baudet earlier, but I got a call from Art Baudet as we were struggling with getting our application together, and he said they were going to write one, and what would I think about joining forces? Um, and so we discussed it for a couple of days, and then we decided, yeah, we like, we have good colleagues at Baylor, why not? And um, so that led to Baylor Hopkins. The biology and the progress of the Mendelian centers, in my opinion, obviously I'm quite biased. But uh, in my opinion, it's been really remarkable, and it's exposing all kinds of really interesting biology, just really interesting biology. And, and all of that biology is essentially following the paradigm of you have some human or some set of humans who have some interesting problem, and um, mother I always say Mother Nature is trying to tell you something, and we just have to learn how to be smart enough to understand what she's saying. And um, uh, so what we're learning is that by unearthing the uh, uh, Mendelian um, component of, of those interesting uh, phenotypes, um, all of a sudden we enter into some new area of biology that has been overlooked and it turns out to be fascinating and important for human health. Uh, and um, so it just happens over and over and over again. And so I'm very pleased to be part of this one of the centers for Mendelian genomics, and um, I think we've done great work, uh, and, but there's a big job ahead. I actually think um, that there should be, I was thinking this morning, um, there should be a, a project or an effort, I've been pushing this for a while now, an effort to hook a phenotype to every gene in the genome. And I would call that the human gene to phenotype project, or the HGP squared. Uh, and right now we're at 20% of the genes. And other people think, well, there must be some genes that um, will not have Mendelian, will not have variants that, are, so, that cause Mendelian phenotypes. I don't, I don't think that. I think if we look carefully enough, every gene in the genome will have uh, a Mendelian phenotype associated with it. In order to do that, you have to look around, you have to look at a big population, i.e. the world's population, and you have to have a lot of good phenotyp phenotypic data. Yes, I, I think the, the idea of a, a reference sequence is naive. Again, it's another example of our desire to s simplify things, to help us organize things. And I think it was, it's served its purpose, gangbusters.
but come on, we, we should have the complete sequence, and we should have the complete sequence from lots of representatives of our species, and they should be sampled across the world to maximize diversity, uh, because from the diversity we're gonna learn what's important and what's not important and so forth. And so I think this effort to develop uh, what's come to be called de novo assembly and de novo complete assemblies is uh, it was something that was prominent in the strategy meeting I was at a month or so ago or two months ago, I don't know. And um, I think that's quite a reasonable goal for NHGRI myself. And I think the technology, and NHGRI is the institute to do it, number one. It's, you know, genomes are our business. And um, uh, I think the technology, while not perfect, is is much better now than it was a while ago to do that kind of study. And so I, I think we're bound to learn stuff from that and uh, we should do it. And it will help other areas of science. It'll help the Mendelian projects because we'll have, a, uh, we'll have the right reference for the right person we're interested in understanding. Um, and it will tell us about evolutionary biology, what the history of our species is and um, uh, um, all of that good stuff. And, and you know, I have a colleague at Hopkins who's done, uh, Stephen Salzberg, who's done um, extensive analysis of all of the RNA-seq data he can lay his hands on. Uh, and he looks for transcripts uh, that look like they are uh, messenger RNAs from genes that are not annotated as genes. And so I don't think we have all the genes yet. I don't know how many we're missing. I don't think it's a huge number, but I think we're missing some. It's also confounded by the fact that we can't really uh, get a definition of a gene that everybody agrees to. Um, but if your definition of a gene is something that generates a transcript and that transcript has a function, then I don't think we have all the genes. And since I believe that we can find Mendelian phenotypes for every gene in the genome, I want a full list of the genes. And when I can't tag a phenotype to a particular gene, one of the things I think about is, well, maybe it's... Um, you don't have the gene yet. I don't have the gene yet. That's why I can't find it. I'm not, I'm not looking there. I'm not, um, right. you know. One of, one of the things my interest in biology entailed early on was I would go out in the woods or the meadows or wherever and um, streams, and I would look around, and I would very often spend a lot of time turning over rocks to see what was underneath the rocks. And um, that's what I think, you know, going after Mendelian disease genes is you turn over the rocks and you s sometimes you don't find anything, but sometimes, you know, you find something really amazing. I don't know if it's a salamander or a snake or some sort of centipede or all kinds of interesting things. And um, so you want to be as efficient in that process as you can be, but it's always exciting when you turn over that rock and you see something new and novel. Then it's really, it's great. Thank you.